Thank you so much, Liza. I want to also thank all the organizers, but I'd like to really highlight all of the people that are attending this meeting and came for the second day. Um, I, I think this is so, there are so many stakeholders here. Um, I'm particularly so pleased to see people from the government, from NIH, NCCIH, uh, the neurosciences, NIDA, it's the OBSSR. This is so very important. All the other stakeholders of VA, DOD, and people from other parts of the executive branch, CMS, so very important. This, I think we will look back on these two days uh, as, a, I hope, a turning point. This session will focus on collaborative practice. I'm going to do two quick things. I'm going to talk a little bit about how I got involved in this field in the area of collaborative practice. In, and it takes us back to San Francisco, as Liza's uh, bio sketch did when she gave her story. In the late um, 1980s, in San Francisco, it uh, was the epicenter for HIV AIDS, as many of you know. And it was an epidemic. And we're talking about an epidemic here as well. It was a different type of ep epidemic because we had dual epidemics. We had to stop the spread of HIV AIDS, and that required getting in touch with the public um, and various populations that were at risk, tracking it down, doing the science as we move forward, you know, developing the treatments and so forth. But at the same time, we had to treat patients. So you're stopping an epidemic in the public schools with kids that are teens, and you're also treating individuals. On the treatment side, we had infectious disease docs. Um, these were experts um, in um, infectious disease, but then the disease would go into different parts of the body. Think about all the specialties that were involved, oncology, dermatology, on and on, pulmonology. Psychologists were really, really part of that team. And I want to sort of underscore that. Um, the psychologists were brought in. I was brought in to help with stress and coping with the illness. And at the same time, though, there was the transmission risk. And so they were, we, we were just, we became integral parts of this team. Um, it was egalitarian. This was a time where it was such an urgent situation. We could call anywhere in the country and say, I need your help. And we got that help. And I think we're at that kind of a, a moment now. Uh, as the meds came along, the uh, medications came along, adherence became a major issue. Uh, at the beginning, people had to take 25 pills a day, um, different times of the day, some with meals, some without meals, and we, you couldn't skip. You absolutely couldn't skip. It was absolutely imperative that we had um, it, really high compliance or adherence to medication at a level we'd never seen before. And this wasn't just for 8 to 12 weeks in the study. This would be for the rest of one's life. And uh, so we had to develop measures for adherence. So I had to dust off an old part of my resume of looking at adherence to antihypertensive medications. And it was like drinking from a fire hose to get this ready, to get the measures up for the clinical trials, to figure out the interventions in the clinics and make sure everyone could do that. Um, the, at the same time, and I want to, I'm em emphasizing this because it really was about maintaining behaviors, and now the pills are down to two or three times a day. But it was, it was so important that this had to be done in a certain way and really engaging each single individual. That individual, their intervention was basically you know, personalized. So they were an integral part of the team. They led the team. They were the team. At the same time, you're asking them to not transmit the disease. So very, very important. And it was the m medication side effects that also changed my life. Because if somebody had pain or somebody had um, uh, some problems with neuropathy or something, we didn't want to add another medication that would add more adherence problems and side effects. So I suddenly found myself, and it was the patients educating me. They went to acupuncture. They were having massage. We've got, you know, it's like, oh my goodness. You know, and then we had to come up with dietary interventions that would change the GI tract so that they could take the medications at various times, and they had to not interfere with the medications, no St. John's wort. So all of a sudden, I found myself in integrative medicine. And it really was, you know, really trans-professional teams, egalitarian, absolutely egalitarian, more so than I see in our teams today, where there's this sort of presumption that the physician's the head of the team and the rest are there at that person's, you know, sort of 
beck and call. And, and that was not the case then. And I think going forward, that does, we've got to move beyond that. But there was more, <laughs> and there's more. And that was, we had to work with communities. So just hearkening on what we just heard in the last panel, community homes, community interventions. I was given um, a grant from the Office for Research on Women's Health to try to work with homeless women in the middle of the night to get them to tell the men to use condoms. And, I, and this is being webcast, oh my. And um, <laughs> so I'm there in the middle of the night. It's pouring down rain in San Francisco. It's freezing cold. And I'll never forget, the, you know, it was like if anybody would give me a tent you know, a, a, you know, a part of a, a, a you know, front porch that had a roof over it, forget the condoms. I mean, I was well aware. It was like, oh, my, this is awful. And never, I remember calling back to the Office of Research in Women's Health. I said, we need housing. So I just want to hearken back to the last panel. We need to get these women into group housing. This isn't going to work, getting these women in the middle of the night to tell the men to use condoms. You know, it's like, no. And bless, you know, NIH's... Um, soul, they said, that's okay. You know, quickly put in a modification, you know, get the housing. We got the housing. And so I want to say that, that, so it was individualized, but we also looked, as we did yesterday, at the importance of going to the public. And so I just wanted to highlight that, the social determinants of HIV infection, the social determinants of an opioid epidemic, tremendous parallels. But the adherence is really important because in a primary care physician, refers someone to something and it doesn't work and they don't adhere, they won't do it again. They don't do that. And that's what happened with weight loss and smoking cessation. I'll stop then. I just wanted to, and thank you for standing to tell me, but I wanted to tell you though that story. The other story is really a simple one. It started yesterday morning that says why we need collaborative practice. And that was Mark Ryan getting up here and talking about how he knew what he wanted to do but he didn't have a pathway to do it. He didn't have that collaborative team. And I also want to underscore something that, um, that Kristen mentioned, Kristen Beasley. She really highlighted the importance and suggested that the patient is central to the team. The patient is part of the collaborative practice. So I'm going to stop there, and now we'll hear from Leslie and our other colleagues, Tony and uh, Kristen.